Back in September, just weeks before I moved away from my hometown, for the first time ever, I had the honor of touring the Biosphere 2 with one of my best friends. It was beyond imagination, partially because as a Tucson native, I have fond memories of coming here with family members and visiting family to show off one of the most impactful experiments in human history. The Biosphere 2 is iconic for its infrastructure and what they've been able to accomplish, learn, and find through simulated biospheres. As a plant person, especially as a plant person in a pandemic, it was absolutely unreal to experience the most realistic rainforest in the world, apart from the fact that it's located in one of the driest deserts in the world and only a rainforest simulation. It feels so surreal that this got to be one of my last memories living in the beautiful Tucson, Arizona. I'm so glad that I get to share this with you now, and I'm also so thankful for the Biosphere 2 for opening their doors so graciously and spending the day with Adam and I. I hope that you will enjoy this tour as much as we did. I want to show you just one thing before we go in the rainforest. Okay. Um, and this will be something that you'll probably be. We'll, we'll go down here. This is the orchard. Oh my gosh. So this area is part of the, was part of the food production area. Okay. So these were fruit trees for the most part, except for this tall, uh, which is, a, which is a, a different legume species that wasn't for food, but we've got coffee. Oh my um, gosh, and there's well, beans on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got beans, they're, they're um, viable. So mm -hmm. we, I've got actually quite a few baby coffee plants that we're gonna put in the rainforest. Wow. We've got guavas. This tree right here is a guava. There's also a couple of their guavas. This is a little guava. Figs, and there are quite a few figs on there oh, right yeah. now. And uh, citrus here in the middle. So we've got a grapefruit, a lemon tree, the funny thing about that lemon tree is it produces two types of fruit because it was grafted and they let a uh, sucker come up. Mm -hmm. So we get a funny fruit um, on that one that goes up. And on this one, we get lemons, nice so lemons. Cool. A sour orange back there. And then of course, over here, the probably most common fruit inside Biosphere 2, bananas. Okay. Um, and, and, and again, these are all plants that were originally in here. These are the same plants. So if you're unfamiliar with the history of the Biosphere 2, you should know that it wasn't always what it is today. The construction for the 3.14 acre structure actually started in 1987 and was originally created to test how viable a closed ecosystem would be in order to sustain human life in space. Starting in 1991, eight Biospherians were sealed in the Biosphere 2 for two years. They lived entirely off of the food that they grew within the seven biomes that include a rainforest, an ocean, mangrove wetlands, savanna grassland, desert, an agricultural system, and a human habitat. Throughout the experiment, people were actually allowed to come out to the Biosphere 2 to watch the Biospherians as if they were zoo animals. This is the part that I found the most funny out of all of the little stories that we heard. And in the end, the experiment ended up being a fail due to a lack of oxygen. So when our tour guide says that these trees were the original trees, he means these are the exact trees that the Biospherians ate from and cultivated. Who eats this now? Uh, whoever gets to it first. Wow, so, so it's kind of like anyone who works here can yeah. come down. That's yeah. so cool. <laughs> so we have, we have a plant picker right there, a fruit picker right there that we just, don't bring anybody wants a, you know, wow. uh, some, some uh, lemons or some uh, limes. Most people don't deal with the coffee. I, <laughs> I, I try to get those so that I can um, plant them. Yeah. But the real thing that I wanted to show you in here, I mean, this is, don't get me wrong, the, the plants in here are, are, really, are really cool, but that's what I wanted to show you. So there's one, there's the first aeroid, and there's got a flower on it. Oh, beautiful. Elephant ears? Yeah. That plant probably was of the original, or an originally planted here. Wow. Yeah. Some of those elephant ears were put in here. I don't know what species it is. Yeah, um, I'm not familiar with that one. I haven't seen that. This is kind of, 
the way we allow the plants to run around here is that, you know, this, this thing grew out of this, this uh, planter box here. It is impressive. Yeah, this is, is it, like the leaves are so long, it's uh -huh. almost like a, like a banana, uh -huh. like those ones over yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's nice, it's got these variegated colors. It's a really, as far as, um, you know, samples of plants that we have in the specimens, it's, it's a pretty impressive, it's, oh, yeah. it's a pretty impressive specimen that we have. Chemistry, physics, the hard scientists, hard, hard sciences set the rules, but biology goes around trying to find the loopholes. Yes. It's really, really oh, cool. That's really funny, yeah. that's true. Just see it, all these new leaves. Oh my gosh. I had to remove some of this, that's why it's kind of open here, but. Yeah, um, am I allowed to touch it? Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. We're in an environment where they're growing like they do in, in the ground. So yeah. they don't have, they're not small, they're not compact in size because their roots can go crazy. They can spread out anywhere they want. Yeah. You know, they do probably get less sun than they do in the native environment because of the glass, but you know, yeah. it just produces those large. Is there a flower back there? So here we got one of the flowers. Looks like it, so you can see the little scales on them. Those have gradually become more and more um, formed. Yeah. And then they'll split open and have the, the red juicy um, and you can eat that. You can eat that. I've, I've, I haven't tried it because I'm like, yeah, I don't know. I've heard that if you eat it too soon, it's like really poisonous or something. It might, yeah, it might be. But I've never, I've never eaten them. Um, yeah. In fact, that's probably that's the way it is with a lot of these plants that we'll look at if you eat them early or incorrectly. Yeah. Um, it's not bad. I think there might be another flower or two further down. And now walking this path, absolutely bursting with green, we approach the rainforest, which is the reason that we're here today. This rainforest is home to seven tropical rainforest habitats. First, the lowland rainforest, which will largely hold our precious aeroids and larger trees. The terraces, which include small trees like papaya, palms, and coffee. The ginger belt, which has banana, ginger, and bird of paradise. The bamboo belt, which is exactly what it sounds like the Vahazir, which is meant to simulate the Amazonian seasonal floodplain, and the Tepui, or a cloud forest. Walking into this rainforest, you would never imagine you were in a simulated environment until you looked up. You'll see that my hair gets progressively frizzier, and that's because it was so incredibly humid in this space. That, along with so many other factors that we can't even see, make it possible to grow a rainforest in the middle of a dry desert. So the one plant that I think is, as far as the Araceae family that's cool in this area is this one right here. So this uh -huh. is a philodendron. I, I'm not sure what species, probably Arubescens, because uh -huh. it's got, it's kind of reddish, at least in some, it often is red, but you can see it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an intense climber. Yes. Um, and nice big, you know, arrowhead leaves kind of yeah. like, but it's got this kind of reddish, into it. Um, otherwise, I don't know what species it is, but it's a, definitely a philodendron. Oh my gosh, it's beautiful. And yeah. there's even all the way up there, I think uh -huh. I see some yeah. ripples. Still goes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, this is the only place in the rainforest that it exists. Okay. In our rainforest. And uh, it's, it's, its habitat, so to speak, has been cut back a little bit. We've got a little bit more right there. Yeah, oh, that's great. Um, some of it back there. So. And these are awesome too. Oh yeah, so this is a this is a plant from the ginger family. Okay. It's called Costas. Okay. Um, and it, and we'll see more of it as we go through. But it, there are different ways that it it, it, it kind of shows up in its form. But it often you have this spirally, leafy kind of uh, morphology wow. that it that comes. With. We'll see a lot of them in here. Okay. We have some of these plants get so out of control. I mean, look at this. this yeah, you know, that's massive. But we have to cut them back 
and we'll see some of that as we yeah. as we go. Um, mostly, well, we've been cutting back to uh, enable us to do some new planting. Absolutely. Yeah, these are, are ants get to them yeah. in our in our rainforest. Um, one of the the apex predators inside are the ants, yeah. so to speak. So this is another species from the ginger family, I believe. Um, it's, it's a calathea. Uh -huh. Got these nice. Um, oh, it's yeah. definitely a ground species because that would allow it to really pick up any yeah. remaining light that filters through. And then, of course, probably one of the most common plants inside here. One of the most common is this one. Oh yeah, the syngonium. Um, lots of that, and really. It, shows up in a lot of different variations in here. Yeah. I'm trying to see if I have one right around in here. One, you know, a variega variegated form. Oh, good. As well as um, forms with, you know, this is one, you know, a complete leaf, but we have some with lobes on them. And so it can oh be, my gosh, so cool. Yeah. I'm excited to see that. That's a super common house plant. There's some right there. See how it kind of lobed right there? Oh yeah. Yeah. Part of the issue is when they brought in these plants, especially the understory species, the, the floor, the creeping species, a lot of them were not completely identified. Ah. And so even to this day, the old plant lists say unknown species or unknown pothos, excuse me, unknown syngonium. Or, yeah. Um, so, so that's one of the challenges that we have. Yeah, absolutely. And, and our focus is not really on the, the ground species. Like just a tree. This is a piper. Okay. So it's not a, of the Araceae family. But let's try uh. this. Alright. So just stick that on your tongue. On my tongue? Yeah. And give it a give it a minute or two. Get kind of a funny taste, huh? And then give it a moment. Tell me what happens to your tongue. Oh my gosh. <laughs> What's supposed to happen? Is it kind of going, they're kind of go numb? Whenever I've done it, my tongue goes completely numb. Wow, what is that? Wait, it's doing it right now. Yeah, it's a, it's a little delayed. <laughs> what is, what's going on here? <laughs> just that plant, some... Uh, oh, so people, like, people like eat it? So, yeah, so this is, out? this is an American uh, tropic species and they do use it as kind of a, a spicy type of addition to some of their meals, whether they wrap things in their leaves. Yeah. Um, I don't know to what extent they really eat them, but they <laughs> certainly use it to flavor as garnish, things oh like that. Oh my gosh, and I definitely uh, feel that right it's now. It's in the same family as, as pepper, because it's piper, it's, 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 the, uh, it's the genus. And so they produce flowers that are kind of similar to pepper, just those long, kind of um, yeah. almost like cat tins, but um, and these are white though wow. uh, I've never seen the fruit on it though okay. it's typically a clonal reproducer so that's why it's moving all through here clonally and all of that up there is Piper that whole area okay. it's just where it's all kind of been kept Nice, some more nice Diffenbachia. Yeah. I have you ever smelled it? No. Broken it and smelled it? I haven't. I, I don't know if this, it, it, from one plant to another, it can vary. Uh huh. But if you break a leaf, yeah, smell that. Oh, yeah, that has a smell. It smells like, kind of like javelina. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Oh, it's foul. Yeah, it is. It's bad. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so that's, it's uh, Yeah, that's strange. Yeah, it's, Is there is that so that it deters things from eating it or You know, I don't know if it if it I've heard that javelina will actually eat it. Um, but really? I don't know or, or wild boars will actually eat it, but I don't know. Oh but it God. is a it is an unusual smell and sometimes when I'm working around it I'll knock off a leaf or something I'll be like, "Oh man, <laughs> is there javelina around here or something?" <laughs> Some, and like I say, some plants smell stronger than others. 
Yeah. Uh, and, the, you know, I don't know why one plant would smell stronger than the other, but... Wow. So here's more of that elephant ear. Oh, wow. This one's cool. Yeah. There were two species brought in. This is pro... My guess is this is alocasia because yeah. they say it, you know, the leaves tend to stand up. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the colocasia and xanthosoma tend to kind of droop down a little bit more, but... Yeah. That there is no alocasia on the original plant list. Wow. So I don't know when the division was made between the colocasia and the alocasia, but wow. it's, a, it's a nice specimen. Yeah, it is. Right here in the middle of the, of the rainforest, but we'll see some more in a, in a little while. I love that it has this like edge around. It, yeah. it makes it look very clean. <laughs> nice margin. Yeah. yeah. When the rainforest was being structured and laid out, they specifically planted ginger species and banana trees along the edges of the glass in order to protect the lower light or more vulnerable plants from the radiation of the sun. This is a banana. Yeah, these are all bananas. And those leaves are like eight feet long, uh -huh. if more than that. Yeah. yeah, oh yeah, sometimes those banana leaves get easily 10 feet long. They're wow. impressive in here. And and that's how you might find them, you know, in their, again, in their native environment where they have plenty of room to grow. Because often what we see are plant or banana plants in pots yeah. where their um, underground stem is kept small, mm -hmm. um, constrained by stuff in size. Yeah. So the plant itself is usually constrained in size. The Biosphere 2 is the world's largest earth science experiment, and with that, it is one of the best ways to simulate possible scenarios within climate change and other smaller scale environmental changes. By manipulating the temperature and moisture levels within the rainforest, they're able to draw conclusions on how a real rainforest would react under similar conditions. These are gas lines, Okay. and these are leaf chambers. Leaf chambers? Yes. Okay. So what we did, the goal behind, really the goal behind this research project was to understand how plants use carbon. That, that's okay. really the, how they allocate it in times of stress. Okay. Because what we did was we got the rainforest all nice and, and beautiful looking and then we turned the water off for about two months. Wow. And then we observed the plants. Um, prior to that, we of course got all the readings, all the kind of control readings. We climbed up into the space frame. You can see right up there, that kind of grady thing looking up there. That's a platform that okay. we installed. So yeah. we can climb up there and observe the plant responses at the canopy level. So not okay. just at the ground level. We have these chambers up there on the different species. Okay. Those chambers are airtight. There are two tubes going into it. One takes gas, just regular old air in, yeah. and the other pulls out what the plant response is and then we can observe it. So when we ran those plants through, a, um, through the drought, we could observe what those plants were doing with the carbon because we were, the, the, the actual leaf that was in there, we ended up um, tagging it with a, with a molecular tag or okay. a molecular tracer. Oh my god! So gosh. we could then see under those conditions what that plant was doing immediately at the leaf level with yeah. the compound that we put in there. Have results? We have, we're still, oh man, we're working through <laughs> yeah, so much data. Well, yeah, um, it just ended in, well, it's about January. I mean, it we officially ended in December, but it kind of dragged into January. So but we're uh, still dealing with mountains and mountains of data. Wow. I mean, that's the kind of work that you can do in this kind of system that, yeah. you, one, you can't do in a laboratory, right? Because you just don't have enough space. Yeah. But you also can't do in the natural rainforest. Yeah. If you inject carbon into the natural rainforest, <laughs> you're never yeah. ever going to be able to trace it or find it, right? Yeah. So yeah. having a system like this with 16 feet of soil and all these plants isolated, they can run those kind of massive experiments and track everything. Yeah. So we can better understand these, these plants that we all love yeah. and see how they're going to react to these stressors that we're seeing happening around the world. Wow. So and the, the right here, and it's all controlled, and there's a lot controlled. of like, what if scenarios, you can see the results of and yeah, so yeah. we can we can take the results that we get here and give them to scientists and researchers they can then go out in the field and know what to look for yeah. when they when they see similar conditions out there
probably the most spectacular flowers back here are these guys. Oh, wow. So the heliconias. Oh my gosh, those are so unique. Yeah. What, is that coming off of this? Yep. Yeah, it's again related to the, in the ginger, the, the uh, monocot kind of family. Um, but yeah, that's what it's coming off of. Build those kind of lobster like lobster claw like flowers. There are a number of them up in here. Again, a clonal mover. So that's why they only exist in certain small areas in here. Yeah. And uh, pretty amazing looking plant. Possibly, I don't know if I have I have to do a little more research on this, possibly pollinated by ants, because oh. they tend to get really overrun. I mean there was oh, yeah. a, when 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 I was in I was looking at ours here a couple of months back and I was like, man, we get a lot of ants. But then I was in touch with a woman from Brazil who sent me a guidebook on these, and they, some of theirs were like just completely covered with ants. So I'm like, oh, well, ours isn't so bad after all. Yeah. But it's a, uh, it's kind of, it's a really pretty plant, really pretty flower. And there's oh, another one of those. Yeah. Oh my gosh! At this point, it's like just five, what? six different leaves. Yeah, you can't even recognize them. Uh huh. Yeah. So yeah, this is a hibiscus. A hibiscus rosa sinensis. So often it's English, it's, it's common name is Chinese rose. Uh -huh. But um, this whole area is just populated with them. And just all walking along here on the outside, you'll just see these flowers everywhere. As we went through this tour, we were going up winding staircases to get to the next level. We just came from the lowlands and now we're entering the terraces or the second level. You can see these other costas, they produce their flowers at the base like that. Oh yeah. So these are basal costas. These sometimes are red or sometimes turn white like that. Yeah. Ooh, um, nice. So it's like a, almost, you know, almost, almost like a pineapple in a way, where you have a collection of flowers and not one simple flower. Yeah. But I've never seen them uh, produce fruit or anything like that. We did have some fruit in here. You can see all the little flowers. Oh, yeah. How they don't, how they produce almost right on the branch itself. Yeah. And um, the glasses keep fogging up, so I can't tell, but we did have some fruit in here the other day. So you can often see the little, they're, they're greenish initially, and then they turn yellow. You've seen the carpet, I'm sure. Um, they're not bad in here. When, when you're, one of the things that happens is, like, like I mentioned over there, we sometimes have to climb up through the space frame find some of those star fruit, especially if they're green, it just, it just, Delicious. yeah, it's just so, so good. Um, <laughs> it's so hot up there when you get up so high that it's nice to just have that refreshing oh, yeah, um, I bet. fruit. The plants in here don't experience any weather because they're not affect them? So in reality, it, the wind kind of causes them to build stronger bark and stronger uh, to, to lignify more inside yeah. and so in here because they don't get that wind it often we often end up with plants that can maybe be a little weaker sometimes yeah and sometimes a, a branch might break off of a, of a large tree or something like that mm -hmm. and that's the reason why we we don't climb on them the soils and i mentioned this also the soil richness in here is much richer than a real um rainforest soil might be because in rainforest all nutrients are held in the plants yeah. because they cycle the nutrients so quickly. This soil was made from Arizona soils but a lot of it was formed was was made out of um, organic material that was dredged from the bottom of cow ponds. Okay. So it's really really rich soil and oftentimes that richer soil will cause plants to maybe be a little lazier as well so to speak so yeah. they might not build wood as dense as they would otherwise so it might not be strong for that reason okay um, and this soil is used in a lot of studies and like that's a big uh -huh. part of this rainforest yes. is the soil studies yep, yep, okay. yep. yeah you see all the little flags around yeah. those are all areas where we took samples or where we had soil chambers placed mm -hmm. um, we would often we, we have a it's basically a hammer drill that basically puts a core into the ground and then we can we can sample the soil up to about a meter deep. Wow. And so we did that on, oh, I don't remember how many times, a couple hundred places throughout. Mm -hmm. So we could characterize the soil and the microorganisms in the soil. Okay. So they 
so that we could then observe um, the response of microorganisms to the same type of external stimuli that we mm. subjected the plants to. So yeah. the drought, for example, things like that. Yeah. So that helps us because in reality, we like to think that humans rule the world and a lot of people like to think that plants rule the world, yeah. but in reality, microbes rule the world. Yes. Um, <laughs> and so they have a major impact on the atmosphere, on what plants do, on what we do. And so we want to be able to characterize, you know, what kind of, what do they put into the atmosphere as well? All right, so just kind of crumple this up and smell it. Okay, just crumple it? Yeah. Wait, what does that smell like? Oh, what does that smell like? Like a... Like an oil something. Like, you know, like oil diffusers? That's what it reminds me of. What is it? So when the British first came across this plant, they said, well, it smells kind of like cloves. Yes. It smells kind of like maybe a little bit cinnamon or nutmeg maybe a little bit. Wow, it kind of smells like all the spices mixed into one. Mm -hmm. So they named it allspice. Oh, okay. So this is the leaf. Um, we typically get the spice from the seeds. So when it comes to like pests and stuff, uh -huh. like do you do you see any sort of pests that are, yeah, harmful? So we do see some pests um, in here. Although I haven't seen any really since the, there hasn't been a major influx of pests since the drought experiment. Yeah. It seemed to have gotten rid of a lot from that. I don't know why. So they went away when the drought happened? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's Over weird. the course of the drought, a lot of them. In some of the higher branches on some of these trees, we get mealy bugs. Okay. But like I say, we haven't seen many of those. On some of the ginger species and the piper, we'll sometimes see some scale. Um, but it's really rather, it's okay. really quite limited. That's so strange that those pests still find a way in because as you were telling me earlier, not, like nothing new has necessarily been added. They like, did have problems with pests originally. Okay, so um, from the original... They may have survived since then. Wow. Or they may have come in, you know, on somebody's shoe okay. or something like that. That's certainly how um, these pests can move on some, yeah, somebody's shoulder uh, sleeve yeah. or something like that. So. For sure. Okay. Um, I was wondering that because, I mean, everything doesn't, I don't really see like yeah. pest damage or, I mean, obviously on this larger scale, it's not going to be like you see on our house plans. As far as pest control, do you just let it happen? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we have, in the past, some people did try to control, if, control the ants. Because if we can control the ants, then we can use beneficials to control the uh, other insects. Yeah. But if we release beneficials right now, the ants will eat them. Oh. And even if they don't eat them, they'll just kill them. Yeah. Um, it's it's amazing. I I have released some beneficials in here before, and easily within five minutes, those beneficials are getting pulled away by ants. <laughs> because those benefit, the, you know, the beneficials go after the the mealybugs that produce the honeydew that the ants eat. So, oh, so, it, okay, so it's a symbiotic cycle. relationship between the two. Okay, that makes sense. There's one of the platforms that we built. Yeah. So we could just sit right there. Oh my god. Because at times we had to go up there and do the, uh, the research up there, but we had to stay up there for like two hours. Oh my god. So to sit on the space frame just would not have been, I mean, we could have done it, but it's not fun to sit on, the, on, a, on a bar that's, you know, three inches in diameter. Yeah. So we built those. But how do you get up there? Do you climb? Uh -huh. Yeah, we have to climb up the space frame. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little slippery, isn't it? Um, it depends on the time of year. In the summertime, it's not too bad because it's warm enough in here that it keeps most of the humidity. Yeah, yeah. it can be slippery. That's why we tried to climb. Um, when it's when it's a little drier, when yeah. dry, we, and we can dry. One of the things that we can do in here is we can control the humidity in here, yeah. up to a certain point. Yeah. Um, through the air handlers in the basement, we can dehumidify the air. Okay. By far the most common plant we saw throughout the rainforest was Syngonium. It was growing as ground cover, and I couldn't believe just how many tri-leaf and even quad-leaf Syngoniums we saw. 
Among the ground cover, though, there also lies a pest plant. This is one of our, our pest plants. This is a, um, a morning glory. Oh, my, those are the worst. <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> you know, in the natural world, it gets controlled by certain things. You know, it can only go up a tree. Okay, in here, it can go up the space frame. Yeah. So the space frame is all filled up with it. Um, oh, and wow. that's, you know, that's going to block out the light for everything else. So we could not have a proper area with this stuff growing everywhere. There's another species as well, a cissus vine. Yeah that grows in here also. There's still a few um, remains of it, but for the most part, we've cleared it out. And occasionally this, you know, you might find a little one like this. Yeah. Um, they just need a little bit of time and a little bit of light and they start peeking out. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. My there mom has those in her garden and they choke out everything. Yeah. yeah, they twine up. And that's what was happening in here was the, uh, the morning glory would twine up on this syngonium yeah. and would prevent it from unfurling its leaves and then the plant yeah. wouldn't do anything. It basically sort of speaks suffocated. The next environment we went to was the floodplain, which is completely unique and hydrologically independent from the rest of the rainforest. It has a small stream going through it, along with some pretty amazing plants that I think you'll be really happy to see. A month or so ago, this pond was drained okay. because for our, our drought experiment, we needed to have all the moisture out that we could. We wanted to dry down the atmosphere because this puts a lot of humidity in the atmosphere, especially in the heat of the day. So it was drained. And it started with the rainfall that we get in here from our rain system, it started building up. So I put those boards down in there with air stones on them to aerate the pond a little bit. Oh, I forgot. Before we move on. Yes. Right there. Oh. That's a philodendron. That's the saloon. Yes. Yeah, so that's probably the biggest individual philodendron we have in here. Okay. Um, it's an impressive. Oh, yeah. um, and it, 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 you can know for sure that its roots are going down into that water oh, and it's yeah. just loving life. Wow. But it's, it's, a, it's a nice, it's a nice uh, specimen. That's gorgeous. Yeah. So here are some more of your elephant ears. Yeah. Again, I don't know what species that is. Probably yeah. alocasia, I guess. Yeah. But there aren't any on the list that were originally in, so I don't know. But because they're holding upright yeah. and the petioles connect at the notch, um, that'd be my, that's my guess. But they're yeah. beautiful plants. Oh, and yeah. you know, they're growing right along that stream that runs through here. So wow. they're just pulling the water like crazy out of there. The last philodendron that we really have in here that you'll probably find interesting is, there's the Gloriosum. <gasps> okay. Do you see that? <laughs> so oh yeah, my you, you can't probably step right over into there, but yeah, you can see it's nice, those nice big smooth leaves. Oh my gosh. They're so soft. Yeah, but yeah, nice, you know, Pretty much a new leaf there. Yeah. It's so beautiful. Yeah. It's just perfect. So inside our rainforest, one of the things that we lack are serious hardcore lignin munchers, like termites and such. So the bacteria in here will eat up all the easily consumed stuff, like the chlorophyll, the, the intervenal stuff. Yeah. And we'll leave the more the more difficult stuff to uh, consume. So the veins, um, areas that you know are a little more lignified or have a little more cellulose in them, perhaps. Yeah. But they leave those. So we find those uh, leaf skeletons all over the place. Oh my there. gosh! Can I take this? Of course. Oh my gosh! So that's kind of a behind-the-scenes tour of the rainforest. I wanted to give one last thank you to Jason and Katie who gave us this tour around the rainforest. They were clearly both so knowledgeable and enthusiastic about the biosphere too and everything happening there. I do have more footage of the other biomes within the biosphere too and I would really love to share them with you if you'd like to see it so leave a comment down below if you want to see it and I will get to editing. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video.